you take out your Bible, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 as we talk about being soldiers in the Lord's army. As we think about our Father's Day message today. I hope you're praying for Vacation Bible School as you're turning your Bibles. Um, we got more kids signed up now than we've ever had at this point. And so we moved it to August this year because of the school situation and COVID. And so we're excited. We got a lot of kids signing up, getting ready for Vacation Bible School. We still need a few volunteers. Hey, Austin, can you bring the pulpit for me, please? Thank you. Um, we still have uh, volunteers, uh, need of volunteers, but also some of the craft things. You see the information there in the program. And so we encourage you, if you would, to uh, take a moment and consider that and pray about your involvement in Vacation Bible School, whether in person or before, helping us out with decorations, thank you, or actually being here and working with the kids. So we're looking forward to that. So we're working through... Um, getting ready to talk about First and Second Peter. We primarily do expository preaching, but we have taken a break after finishing up Genesis, which was over a year and a half long, and we're doing some things called Kingdom Focus, and uh, next week we'll be talking about, after COVID, how to make sure we have emotional wellness. I think that's very important. A lot of us are dealing with, uh, dealing with how our feelings are now that COVID's over, and then we're going to have a three-week series on heaven, because if we're going to be kingdom-focused in July, we want to talk about what heaven and what it's like and what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like. And so we'll do that. And then we'll get to First Peter, which I'm looking forward to, as we learn to thrive in this culture that's ever darkening. But today, the challenge is for our men, soldiers in the Lord's Army. I encourage you to take out your notes there if you want and follow along, fill in the blanks in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Paul's the writer. He gives us three descriptors here about being an athlete, being a farmer. But here in the first four verses, he talks about being a soldier. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust the faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus, and no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. And may God add his blessing at the reading of his word this morning. You know, one critical aspect of fatherhood that's plaguing our society in epidemic proportions is fatherlessness. In America and throughout the world, absenteeism is pervasive, and the ramifications are devastating. Fatherlessness adversely affects individuals and our families and our neighborhoods, our churches, our cities, our nations. Studies show that fatherlessness impacts education, poverty levels, social behaviors, health care, emotional development, and a list of other factors that enable a child to be well prepared for life when they grow up and become adults. Coupled with fatherless crisis is the innate struggle men encounter not only just being present but being a good father. That's a challenge because many fathers didn't grow up in a home where either they had a father or a father that was exemplary for them to emulate. So being present is one thing, but being a good dad is a whole other ball game. Many dads are present in the home, but being present is no guarantee that they're loving and nurturing fathers of God and to being the godly fathers that God intended for them to be. And we're faced with a challenge and a battle from society to reappropriate what God intended for a man and a father to be. We have to realize as men that we're in a battle, and that battle begins every morning when we wake up, that we're soldiers in the Lord's army. Now, hands down, the favorite song of all time in Awana, every time we do Awana, the kids beg me, we got to do the Lord's army. Now, I was going to have you do that today, but I won't. But, but it says... Uh, Oh, come on, John. <laughs> but it talks about that I may never march in the infantry or ride in the cavalry or zoom or the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army, and there's a lot of truth in that little song. And every day, whether we like it or not, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, as Christ followers, we're in a battle between Christ and Satan, between a biblical worldview and a secular worldview. 
a worldview that attempts to explain life minus God and miracles. That's what the world out there is trying to say. Science is the answer to all things. The current world system is working overtime to construct a new way of looking at reality and are convincing many people, even Christ followers, are buying into it. And the real battle that you and I face is the battle between letting the Holy Spirit fill and control our lives versus living by our own selfish desires and our feelings with no concern for accountability at the end of our lives. You and I, we need to be prepared and equipped as men who lead our wives and our families. And more than ever, godly men need to step up to the challenge and be loud and proud about their walk with Christ. So in keeping with that thought of being a good soldier of Christ, we're going to look at these four verses here in 2 Timothy chapter 2 for wisdom and insight on how we can be prepared and equipped to face our enemy, the flesh, and the devil. First thing we see on your outline is be on mission for God. Be on mission for God. That's why military people voluntarily enlist. They want to be part of the mission to represent their country, to stand for democracy and freedom and protection. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Remember, the battle started when you moved from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. The battle started when you moved from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. James 4.4 4 says, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity or hatred with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Think about it. When you cross that line of faith, if you came to faith in Jesus Christ, if you came to the place where you realized you were a sinner in need of a Savior, where you realized that you had no ability or no way to get into heaven because God is holy and you're not, you're a sinner, you came to the place where Jesus was the substitute for your sin, where he died on the cross, where he shed his blood, where he finished the work that needed to be done to buy us back, to become part of his family. And when we turn from our sin and we ask Christ into our heart and life, we cross from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And Satan does not like that at all. And what he does, he puts a target on your back and my back. And he doesn't spend a lot of time with those that are in the kingdom of darkness because he already has them. But Satan and the demons of hell are all about discouraging us and putting down our witness and uh, hurting us so that our influence and our testimony will not impact other people for the cause of Christ. So remember that, that each morning we face a battle. Second of all, remember each morning that we are engaged in a battle for the souls of men. Not only for your souls, not only for your wife, not only for your children. If you're single, not just yourself or your roommate at college or whatever it may be. Or maybe you're single and at, a, at a job. God's involved in you influencing their life for their soul, their eternal destiny. The problem is that we don't approach the day with that mind oftentimes. That's why for myself, I get up early in the morning. And I make it a point, the first thing in the morning, is to get alone with God, to get into his word, and to pray, and have dialogue with the commander-in-chief. And he gives me my marching orders for the day. I lay out my daily planner, and I say, God, this is your daily planner. You put into it whatever you want. We allow for divine interruption into the plan for today. And God and I lay out the battle plan, the daily responsibilities to stay on point and to work to expand God's kingdom and push back the darkness. There's a great promise in Psalm 37. It says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. As our Converge president, Scott Rideout, used to, to say to his congregation at the end of their services when he was pastor in Arizona, he would say, pray for God to show you what you need to do and then pray for the courage to go out and do it. It's one thing to know what to do and for God to give you the wisdom and the understanding, but then we need to have the courage to go out and obey and do what God says. The will of God in our lives is given to us most often on a daily basis. As we walk with God, as we do the things that are right in front of us today, he will incrementally take us where he wants us to be. In Psalm 84, 7, it says they go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. 
So this walk with God is a daily journey. And he gives us enough strength and enough mercy, enough grace and compassion to get us through that 24-hour period. And guess what? When you wake up tomorrow, you get a whole new installment, a new gift of grace and mercy and love and wisdom and strength. We're told in Matthew 6 that we're only to be concerned for today because tomorrow has enough troubles of its own. James 4 reminds us that we're not to boast about tomorrow because we don't know that we're promised tomorrow. God knows the number of our days. We can plan the future by faith, but only know God knows what tomorrow will bring our way. And then remember that your source of strength is in the daily grace that is available to you. Your source of strength is in the daily grace that is available to you. There's a fictitious story about a baseball game between the Lord and Satan. And they played this baseball game, and it was the bottom of the ninth. The Lord's team was the home team. There was no score. There were two outs. And up to the plate, first came love. And love, wouldn't you know it, love hit a single and got on first base. Because love never fails, as it tells us in 1 Corinthians 13. In this fictitious game, faith came up next. And faith got a single because faith follows love, according to 1 Corinthians 13. Well, wisdom got up. And wisdom wouldn't swing at anything that Satan threw his way. And so he waited and he got four balls and ended up on first base. And then the Lord turned to the coach and said, put Grace up, our star player. He said, Grace? Man, that guy is little, he's scrawny, he can't hit very far. And the Lord says, no, put him up. Put Grace up to the plate. And sure enough, Grace got up first pitch. He had a drive out beyond the center fielder. The center fielder ran back, reached up with his glove. The glove, it snapped, it went off his glove, hit him in the head, knocked the center fielder down, and the ball went over the fence, and he won the game with a grand slam. And the coach turned to him and says, why did you put grace up? And God said to him this. He said, love, faith, and wisdom will get you on base, but only my grace can get you home. Only my grace can get you home. And you know, that's what it is. We need to be strengthened daily in God's grace. Lamentations 3, great promise for us to hold on to. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. So here's the application. Are you living life daily with clarity and intentionality for the mission? Are you living with clarity and intentionality for the mission? In 1629, Shah Haran, his wife died. He was a very famous person there in India and uh, had the burial service, but he wanted to honor his wife. And so he took her casket and put it on this parcel of ground. And then, because he was wealthy, he constructed, uh, a, began to construct this beautiful temple. And he hired people to do it, and it took several years to do it. Well, wouldn't you know it, he was so driven, he was so focused on building this beautiful edifice that he forgot about his wife's casket. And one day, he kind of bumped into it. He didn't remember what it was, and he had the workers get rid of it. And a few months later, he realized that he had destroyed his wife's coffin. Well, he continued to build this beautiful building, which we know today as the Taj Mahal. He forgot his mission. He forgot what the purpose was for building that to honor his wonderful wife. Don't forget the mission that we are on. Second of all, be mentoring. Be mentoring others to grow in the faith during the battle. In 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, a great verse as we think of discipleship and evangelism. And what you have heard from me, Paul said, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Paul says, I've poured out my life and my teachings upon you, the teachings of Christ. Find reliable men and women to pour into those same truths so in turn they can be disciple makers who will influence the people around them but also pass the baton of faith to future generations to keep this thing of Christianity going. So for you and I as men, we are to be recruiting new soldiers as being 
part of the Lord's army. We're to be recruiters. We're to share the gospel with people. We're to do evangelism. And what is evangelism? It begins with spiritual conversations, praying for opportunities on a daily basis to share with them about the Lord. I mean, something, as I was sharing with the elders yesterday, something as simple as, as the weather. Somebody could say, isn't this a beautiful day? And you could say, yeah, isn't this great how God created this beautiful day that we have before us? And you kind of see where people are at when you say those sorts of things. Or you offer to pray for someone. Begin spiritual conversations. And then as time comes along, you may have the opportunity to share the gospel as well. We're to be about the business of recruiting others from the enemy's side to join us in the battle on God's side. God's side will be the winner of the war in the end, but we have to continue to fight these skirmishes and these battles against the power of darkness as God moves closer to winning the battle against evil. And as we read in Revelation 21 22, God will eventually eradicate evil once and for all when he sets up the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem comes down and Christ rules and reigns on this planet. So we're to be recruiting new soldiers, but we're also to be in the business of refining soldiers to be battle ready. Evangelism and now discipleship. Two sides of the same coin. They all go together, but we need to, when somebody crosses that line of faith, when they become a new believer in Christ, we're to help them as they join this kingdom of light to prepare and equip them for battle. We have to disciple new believers so they're not tossed about by every wind of doctrine. That's why with new recruits, they have what's called boot camp. And for us, when we have a new believer, we take them through spiritual boot camp to make sure that they're battle-tested, that they're ready, so they in turn can disciple others to engage in the battle ahead of them. We want to make this more than words, but a reality. And the elders, we met yesterday, and we spent a considerable amount of time talking about that, and we'll share plans for that as we move forward through the summer. But each of us in this room, if we know Christ, we're on our own spiritual journey. And each of us, as I've stated before, have people under our influence and leadership. Children and grandchildren are looking for godly leaders to pour their lives into them with the timeless truths and eternal values of God's word. And it takes time. It takes patience. It takes intentionality. It takes perseverance. Up on the screen, you'll see a couple resources that I want to give to you, just let you know about. This week, I was listening to WDLM, and uh, Pastor Rick McGew, which used to pastor here in the Quad Cities, he started an organization several years ago called localchurchapologetics.org. There's the website. And uh, he has a great, great book, Got a Moment Family Devotions. And uh, you've probably, maybe if you listen to WDLM, you hear his little clips and he's put it into a script. And then you take your camera and the QR code and you go and you can hear it played. And then there's some action steps and some practical things that you might want to share with your kids and your grandkids. I know we bought two of them this week ourselves. Another book that I bought um, my son-in-law called The Very Best Hands-On Kind of Dangerous Family Devotions. And <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun, jello, potato guns, all kinds of crazy things. But uh, my son-in-law is enjoying it, and uh, I give that to you as a resource to maybe spice up those times with your kids at home and uh, put these in from time to time and make sure they're safe when you do these things. But, and then don't forget, out there in the lobby, I just want to reiterate, this Bible is fantastic. I want to encourage our men to grab this Bible to help you, to equip you so you can equip your family as well. So there's some resources to help you be a discipler to your kids and your grandkids. The application here is how are you doing in imparting your faith into others? How are you doing in imparting your faith into others? And thirdly, be motivated to engage in the battle with fellow soldiers, no matter the suffering. No matter the suffering, be motivated to engage, to be involved, to come alongside other men and fight and push back the darkness that's in this world. Take your Bible, if you would, turn over to Ephesians chapter 6. I'm sure if you're a Christian and you've been one very long, you are very aware about this section of Scripture, spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Paul's talking about how we can 
understand the enemy, but also to put on the armor of God to resist the temptations, the fiery darts that will come our way for sure. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And I would underline these words, and having done all to stand firm, and having done all to stand firm, we have a responsibility. We have to pray on. We have to take on the armor of God and then stand firm in it. Verse 14, here are the descriptors of it. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. In the early part of that section, he says, understand who your enemy is that wants to engage in battle with you. The world system, the current culture we find ourselves in. And remember, God ordained for us to be here for such a time as this. In eternity past, God knew what it was going to be like in June of 2021. He knew when we would be born. We don't need to lament. We don't need to be uh, discouraged. But know that God has placed us here at this time for this purpose. So we battle the world system. We battle the flesh, our selfish desires, our, our passions, the things that uh, make us want to be independent of God's teachings and his word. We sometimes call it the old nature. And then the devil. Diabolos, the deceiver, the one Jesus called the father of lies. So that's our enemy, and we need to understand that. And then we're to put on the entire, the whole armor of God, not partial protection. Do all you can in preparation to stand firm in battle. That is the belt of truth. As I just mentioned, Jesus called Satan a liar. But the believer whose life is controlled by truth will defeat him. The belt holds the other parts of the armor together. They used to have long flowing robes. And so and when they were getting ready to go into battle, they'd pull up those uh, bottoms of those robes and tuck them into the belt so they could run and not trip over the material. And also the belt held other parts of the armor together. And truth is the integrating force in the life of a victorious Christian. A man of integrity with a clear conscience can face the enemy without fear. The belt also held a sword. And unless we practice the truth, we cannot use the word of truth. Once a lie gets into the life of a believer, everything begins to fall apart. We see the breastplate of righteousness. This piece of armor is made of metal plates or chains. It covered the body from neck to waist, from front to back. And it symbolizes the believer's righteousness in Christ, as well as the righteous life that we live in Christ. The shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. The Roman soldier, he wore sandals with hobnails in the soles to give him a better footing opportunity for the battle. And if we're going to stand and withstand, then we need the shoes of the gospel because we need to have peace with God and peace in God as we fight the battle side by side with our fellow brothers and sisters in the faith. We must be at peace with God and with each other if we're going to defeat the devil. And then you see the shield of faith. And it was large. It was about four feet wide, uh, two, or two feet wide, four feet high. It was made of wood. It was covered by leather. Sometimes the enemy would take their arrows and dip them into flammable liquid and light them. And with the leather on that wood, it would extinguish those arrows as they came in. But the edges of these shields were so constructed that an entire line of soldiers could interlock their shields and march into the enemy like they were a solid wall. This suggests that we as Christians were not alone in the battle. The faith mentioned here is not saving faith, but rather living faith, 
A trust in the promises and the power of God. Faith is a defensive weapon to protect us from Satan's onslaught of fiery darts. Then the helmet of salvation. Satan wants to attack the mind that we have like he did Eve in the garden and deceive her. The helmet refers to the mind controlled by God. Then there's the sword of the spirit. That's the only offensive weapon you see here in Ephesians chapter 6. The word of God, the Roman soldier wore on his belt a short sword which was used for close in fighting. And Hebrews 4.12 compares the word of God to a sword because it's sharp and able to pierce the inner man just as a material sword pierces the body. Notice, there's no discussion of protection except for the back because you, it was designed for you to be on the offensive. There are no deserters and there are no retreaters turning their back on the enemy in God's army. And so in one sense, we're given the full armor of God at salvation because the full armor of God represents Jesus Christ. But yet, according to the scripture, we have to put it on daily. We have to pray on the pieces and remember what they represent so that we can stand and be faithful fellow soldiers with those around us. 2 Timothy 2, 3, the verse in this section says, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. So here's three things that we need to be as good soldiers to fight along with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Number one, be a servant leader. As men, you're not to be authoritarian in your leadership style, that you're to be humble, that you're to look at your spouse as your team player. But at the end of the day, sometimes you have to make the decision and you have to be the one who decides. But you take input, you listen to others, you humbly serve your wife and your family. You do that at work, you do that at church as well. People respect servant leaders. Be a team player. I don't have to remind you there's no I in team, right? That all of us, we need to work together in harmony, in unity with one another as believers in Christ. And so at home, you're a team. You work together with your wife if you're the husband. And you work together with your kids. And you work together with others at church and at work. And be a team player and come alongside and, and uh, give and take as you can. And then thirdly, be decisive in battle. Be decisive in battle. In the men's group, we're going through Tony Evans' book, Kingdom Men Rising. It talks about show up, to be strong, to be decisive in the battle. And that means that you get input from your wife as you make decisions. And you try to make those decisions together, but be decisive. Be decisive in what you're going to do. So the application is, how is your attitude as you partner with your fellow soldiers? First, beginning with your wife, your kids, your fellow believers in church, even those that you work with there as a team. How is your attitude as you partner with fellow soldiers? And then fourthly, be careful to avoid the minefields that bring destruction. You know, a good soldier has to have a mind sweep as they have a point man that goes out and he sweeps the field and he looks for the, the mines so that they won't step on them or blow up a vehicle if they can do that, if at all possible. They avoid destruction. It says in 2 Timothy 4, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. We need to stay focused on the one who has enlisted us, God the Father, our commander-in-chief. And how do we do that? Well, men, you're to be the protector of your family the protector of your family. Protect them against false teaching. Protect them against living by feelings rather than the word of God. Colossians 2.8 says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. You have to be a discerner of the truth and teach your family to be discerners of the truth as well. And then you have to be the provider of your family, making sure the financial, the emotional, the spiritual, and the physical needs of the family are met. Over time, roles have changed in our society. It's not wrong for the wife if she has a job that 
brings in more income than the husband to do that. But the key is that the husband must make sure that the family is provided for in all these areas, spiritually, financially, physically, and emotionally. That's important to be the provider. Thirdly, practice what you preach. The faith is caught with your family as much as it's taught. Each of us as men, we're not perfect, but we need to live out the truth as much as we can as exemplary followers of Christ. We need, we need to be blameless. We need to apologize when we do something wrong with our kids or our spouse. We need to humble ourselves. And we can't live perfect lives, but we can live blameless lives before them. And fourthly, point to the way of truth. Be aware of your kids, friends, and the influencers in their lives. Be intentional and intense about standing for the truth. There's been a lot of discussion lately on the news. Since kids have been online a lot of places last year and through Zoom and Google Meet and a variety of different ways, parents have been able to tune in and see what curriculum and what the kids are uh, studying with their teachers. And there's been some alarming things being taught and loud in Virginia been in the news a lot lately where the parents have been continually challenging the school board there because of the sex ed material they're teaching to kids in first grade on up and also the critical race theory things as well. Chapters and other parts of the country are being created because parents are getting uh, aware of what's going on in their school districts and are standing up and challenging what's being taught to their kids in school. We need to be on point to the way of truth. Here's the application. Are you aware of the potential dangers of your enemy? Are you aware of the potential dangers of your enemy? That's your role as a dad in the home. And lastly, be mindful of who you're serving and aim to please. Be mindful of who you are serving and who you aim to please. At the end of verse 4 in 2 Timothy chapter 2, it says, Since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Remember whose uniform you wear. Remember whose uniform you wear. I came across this verse the last few weeks, and I've heard it several times, and it's really made an impact on my life. I encourage you men to write this down, Isaiah 66 2. But this is the one to whom I will look, God says. This is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Man, that just convicted me big time. Trembles at my word. Here's the question. Who are you most loyal to? Are, you, are we humble and contrite in spirit as men? Do we tremble at God's word? Do we revered enough to obey it without questioning? Do we trust God's word over our feelings? When we hear God's word, does it impact us? Do we want to do something, be obedient to what it says? And then remember who the commander-in-chief is that you serve. Keep in mind that you're playing to an audience of one. In 2 Corinthians 16.9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. God's eyes. He sees everything. He sees what's going on, not only our actions, but he knows what's in our heart and in our minds. That's a scary thought. It's a humbling thought to think about. I, by nature, am a people pleaser. It's something that I've had to work through all my life. You know, I just want everyone to like me and everyone to get along. Why can't we all be friends, that song says, right? And I think we should all be that way. And I strive for that. But the reality is, it's not going to happen all the time. I don't like drama, so I like to solve all the problems if I can. But it never works in the flesh and in this life. It's unrealistic, but I still try at times. But I've come to the place in recent years to surrender the fact that I only have to follow and please one person, and that's God the Father. As I said, I play to an audience of one, and that's what keeps me centered and focused instead of allowing what everyone thinks controlling how I feel about myself. It isn't I, that I don't care about how people think about me, but I've come to the place that it's all right. If my relationship is good with God the Father, and my relationship is as good as I can make it with my brothers and sisters in Christ and those in the world around me, then I can lay my pillow, my head on the pillow at night and have a clear conscience. 
because I pleased him. I played to the audience of one. And so I hope that you get to that place, that no matter what you do, whether your boss is watching what you do at work or not, whether people see uh, all the practice that you're putting in to be a good player on the team and all those things, know that God is always, always watching. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. But we have to be reminded as men that we're going to stand accountable one day. As I teach at the community college Survey of World Religions, I tell my students on the very first day that I do not grade on the curve. You're going to have to earn every point for the semester. And I'm not a hard taskmaster. Most of my students end up with A's. I think of over 10 years, I've only flunked two students. But the point is that there's going to be accountability. There's going to be grades and things you'll have to do. And you and I, as men and as women here in this room, the Bible is our textbook. And we're in the classroom of life. And it's the Holy Spirit that's our teacher. And God the Father is the principal. And we're going to be standing accountable to him at the end of life. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So we have to keep that always in the back of our mind, that as he looks down on us and we're serving him, that we will give an account for our lives. So here's the application. Are you prepared for inspection? A good soldier is always ready for inspection. Whether it's announced or not, he has his equipment ready and clean and ready to go. Are you prepared for inspection? Being a father puts things into perspective. Rory McIlroy, who is a star on the PGA Tour in golf, 2021 is going to be very different because in August of 2020, he and his wife Erica became parents to a lovely little girl named Poppy. They said she's the absolute love of their lives. And of course, having a baby changes everything, and McElroy said this in a recent interview. He said, before I had a family, golf was most important, and then once you have a family, golf is definitely not the most important. It's your family. By, they're, they're by far the most important part of your life. I don't know. It just puts things in perspective. I love golf, and I enjoy it, and it's my job. Whether I played on the PGA Tour or not, I'd still play the game of golf, but it's one of those where once you have a family, all your priorities change, but in a good way, in a very good way, end of quote. So what's your perspective, men, at this Father's Day 2021 as a father or as a grandfather? Here's the key thought. Will you be daily committed to do what it takes to fight faithfully in the battle that's already won? Isn't it great to know that we're fighting in a battle that's already won? We might get tired in the skirmishes. We might get tired of dealing with the flesh and our sinful nature. But guess what? We're going to have resurrected bodies. We're going to be perfect. And we're going to be on an earth where Christ rules and reigns, where there's no evil, where there's no sin, where Satan will be gone and cast into the lake of fire. Well, as I close today, I want to turn to the needs of the fathers here today. And after a sermon like that, you may feel you can't measure up to what God wants you to be as a father. You and I, we might have had a father who was not in our lives or was a poor example or wasn't a Christian or an alcoholic or you fill in the blank. We can find comfort by looking to our heavenly father to overcome our earthly father's inadequacies. And we talk about God as our father. The idea of a father creates unique images in the minds of all of us as we think of our own father. We often view God how we view our father. I had a great father. There was many things as a young adult I looked back and I wanted to emulate, but there were things I didn't want to emulate. And it's up to each man and woman to look at their parents and decide and take the good things away and learn from the bad things in their lives, just like our kids do with us as well. But when we think of our Heavenly Father, we're thinking of someone who is perfect in all areas. And so when we think about him, it conjures up all kinds of thoughts. It might bring up a picture of love and laughter and respect and acceptance. We think about God as our model father in the truest sense of the word, that he's willing to pay any price in order to save us from sin. Romans 8.32, you know, as he did not spare his own son, but willingly gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with Christ, give us all things for this life? 
Your Heavenly Father is always ready to meet your needs. Your Heavenly Father loves you so much, he was willing to discipline you, to bring you back and bring you on to Christian maturity. Even when we rail against God and reject his love, our Father continues to love us, as we see in the picture of the prodigal son in Luke 15. He doesn't make his love for us unconditional about how much we love him, but he loves us even when we don't love him. Our God, the Father, has made you heirs and reserves a home for you in heaven. This is what a father is like biblically. And if this has not been your experience, it can be now. You can turn your life over. You can be adopted into his forever family, according to John 1.12. It says, as many as received him, to them they became the sons and the daughters of God. Take comfort, take strength from him, your heavenly father. Here's three questions before we pray. Will you wake up each morning this week remembering that the battle before us belongs to the Lord? I encourage you to take this paper home and put it by your bedside and think about these questions. Second of all, you suit it up in preparation spiritually for what the enemy may throw your way each day this week. And thirdly, are you staying in constant communication with your commander-in-chief for instructions on how to fight the daily battle? And I hope that all of our men and Fathers here know Christ as Savior. And that's the most important thing you can do is to make sure that you have a relationship with him as I described earlier in the message to step out on faith and trust what he did on the cross to give us the hope of eternal life. Let's pray. I want to pray for our men today. Father, I pray for us as men. Lord, you help us to remove the excuses in our life that keep us from obeying you. I think of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in his humanity, begged God not to have to go to the cross, but he didn't use that as an excuse. He went all the way to the cross for us. How could we not be faithfully obeying you? So Lord, help us to remove the excuses in our life. Help us to live a no regret life. Help us to be willing when we fail to confront our failure, to go and and talk to someone, whether it's our kid or our, our kids or a spouse, and we've hurt a relationship, that we would own it and that we would do something about it and reconcile it. And Lord, help us to look to your word, look to other Christian men around us to gain insight and godly counsel on how we can grow and continue to be the godly fathers and grandfathers that you would want us to be. Lord, there's so much on the line in our world today. We just need godly men to rise up and stand and to be decisive and stand strong in battle whether anyone else stands with them or not. Give each one of the men in our church strength and comfort and grace for the work ahead as soldiers in the Lord's army. We pray and ask in Jesus' name, amen.